All right, we got plenty of room up over here in front so you can see better. So I encourage everybody to come over here who is here and you got the good seats and we'll get started in a couple minutes. And the comfy ones are still available right up here. That's always a good one. Yeah, for those who can't see, in fact, it's hidden, but there are couches basically up here, so it's really, it's really nice. Yeah, I'm just saying. Smart people. See, I'm just saying it's if they're comfy. I mean, we put the best seats up in front to encourage people because Catholics have this weird habit of sitting way back, and it's kind of odd. I think if you believe the Lord was here, you'd want to be close to Him. But I don't know. Maybe you've been reading too much Old Testament, and you're really terrified because I get terrified as well. We'll talk about that. <clears throat> okay. That's right. It's the days where you're not sure if I sit or stand and you don't want to be the person in front that everybody's looking at. Yeah, exactly. It's always fun at funerals when you know there's some people there who haven't been there for a while and they're like not sure where to be in there in front. It's just, it's always funny. Anyway. All right. Let's go ahead and we'll get started. I know people are still rolling in because uh, that's what they do, but we're gonna, we got a lot to cover. So we'll go ahead and get started. I think technology is working. So los que necesitan traducción. Creo que la tecnología está funcionando, ¿ya? Yeah. Ok, good. All right. Si no está funcionando, levante la mano, habla con Bernardino, y él va a ayudarles. Ok, él está aquí con la Virgen, ¿verdad? En el manto. Ok, good. All right. Good. Let's go ahead and we'll pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for this final gathering of the year before we begin 2023. We ask that as we study your word, that you would fill our hearts with light and truth. You would purify us of any sins. You would help us to see in Israel our own perverseness and our need for grace. Come Holy Spirit. Blessed Mother, we ask that you would intercede for us and help us to receive the great teaching that is here in your word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Alice, pray for us. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And notice I lit candles over here and we put our relic of St. Alice on the table because tomorrow is our feast day. So it's begun the feast already. We're in the first vespers of St. Alice. And so um, we'll have an opportunity for veneration uh, during any of the breaks or um, we'll, even, we'll, have, we'll have her out all night as well for anyone who would like to venerate her as well as all day tomorrow. So um, great. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get started. We're in the book of Numbers. So if you remember last time, we haven't met in a couple weeks, but the last class we had we went through Exodus and Leviticus, the end part and all of Leviticus. We saw God's plan to make all of Israel a nation of priests, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That didn't last long because of the golden calf. And so the book of Leviticus was formed and the Levites became priests instead of everyone else. Okay. We also saw that the, there was a description of the tabernacle in the wilderness being a new garden of Eden that would travel around with the Israelites. It would be a place where God would walk with them again. So the tabernacle becomes the place where God dwells on earth or a new Eden. And you see descriptions of kind of the decorations that remind us of the garden. We also saw that all the sacrifices in, Le in Leviticus find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice. The whole burnt offering, the sin offering, the peace offering, the atonement offering, all of those, it, he takes them all into himself. So today we're looking at the book of Numbers, and it's called the book of Numbers because it's about two censuses that happen for the first generation of people who left Egypt, and then after 40 years, they number the people twice in the book. So that's kind of the book ends. It's kind of the division of the book, the first 25 chapters of the first generation, and then you split into the second generation from 26 onward. Okay, but really in Hebrew, the, the, the title is In the Wilderness, which is an accurate description because they are lost. <laughs> and it's this accurate description where they are geographically, but also spiritually, that they're lost and they need God. Okay, some fundamental themes we're going to see here um, is that... Um, there's penance for sin. In fact, a lot of penance for sin. And in fact, if you think about it, every day of disobedience got them a year of penance in the desert. Think about this when you're committing sin. We do not understand the punishment that is just for our sins, right? 
Eeks. So, so we think about that. Second, law is added because of sin. So every time they sin, there are more rules that are added, right? So that's a, a principle that St. Paul says, the law was added because of transgressions. So we see that play out. Then we see there are 10 rebellions in the desert, just like there were 10 plagues that was the fullness of God's judgment. There are 10 rebellions in the desert, the fullness of rebellion, right? Then we see there's jealousy over the priesthood. That pops up several times. And then there's complaining a lot. And every time they complain, it leads to death. It's bad. So complaining is bad. Okay, so that's a theme there. So we'll go ahead and we'll kind of go through the book. We'll kind of go through summaries of the chapters. And as we go through it, you'll encounter these themes. So as we begin in chapter one, it starts with the first census and they number people and it's a lot of people and you probably glazed over a lot of the names, uh, but that's okay. Um, I forgive you. And so does God. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, probably. And so anyway, they come and we see at the end of the chapter, the whole number, chapter 146, it says that was 603,550. And the Levites not being numbered among them. So we see this huge, over half a million people of the men, just the men alone, we're seeing the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that they'll be like the sands of the shore of the sea. So they've multiplied exceedingly in the desert. But the Levites, they're set apart and their job is going to be to take care of the holy things. And as we look at the setup of the tabernacle in the chapter two, it describes it, the tabernacle's in the middle, the Levites camp around it to protect people from accidentally touching the holy things and dying. And then you have three tribes on each side. So the 12 tribes are split up evenly around it. This is an ancient war camp. That's how they would, they would do it. The emperor would be in the middle with his, with his, with his tent. And then you'd have the priests and then uh, the soldiers around so that the last thing to get hit is the king, right? And so that's the way they're, they're described. And so this is looking forward to the conquest they're gonna have in the promised land, where they're gonna go in with the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence leading them into battle, okay? So, but in the wilderness, it's the same, that this is how they are set up, okay? So you see the description of that, um, of who's where. You get to chapter three, and now you talk about the priesthood in chapters three and four. And so we see there's a distinction here between Aaron and his sons and the Levites. And this is important because oftentimes they say the Levites and the priests, they use them interchangeably. What they're talking about, Aaron and his sons are the priests. The Levites, their job, as you see, they have the job of taking care of the holy things. They're like altar servers or deacons. So you have kind of this stratification where they call them priests, but really there are only sacrificial priests here, Aaron being the high priest and his sons being priests with him, okay? So that's what's happening. You have Aaron the high priest, his sons who are priests who actually offer sacrifice. The Levites, all the different family heads within that tribe have different responsibilities, and you see what those are. You see the Kohathites, the Kohathites, they are in charge of the holiest things. They handle the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the, the Holy of Holies, the things in there, and then you have the Gershonites and the Maronites, they're taking care of the other stuff, the poles, the tent pegs, other things like that. This is important because the Kohathites, from them are gonna come a rebellion, and we're gonna see that happen and why that's the case, because of jealousy about the priesthood. They're so close to the holy things, but they can't offer sacrifice. Why is that? It's not fair. I should be able to do that too. Anyway, so we see that's the tension that's going on here, that, that's, that basically they're altar servers or deacons, depending on their role. So the Kohathites would be like the deacons, they're the closest to being priests. And then you have others who are kind of carrying water or just the grunt labor that are like washing stuff and carrying things around. Okay, good. And then of course the Levites are taken in place of the firstborns. We see very explicitly the firstborn were meant to be the priests and the Levites take their place because of the sin of the golden calf. So that's, that's very clearly spelled out in chapter three, okay, and four. Now look at this, the Kohathites in chapter four, it says, this is the service of the Kohathites. They are to carry out the most holy things. If you go to verse 15, what's interesting, some of the descriptions, I just like this, if you, I can't talk about it a lot, but it talks about covering everything in goat skin. Isn't that interesting? Who else was covered with goat skin and hair? Remember that, Jacob? It's so like there's all these ties of like, covering things with goats. I mean, it's interesting, we can't talk about it, but there's spiritual stuff there if you study it. Um, cloth of blue, because blue is for royalty and divinity. Why do you think our lady is dressed in blue? Mm, interesting. Anyway, another story. Uh, moving on, so then we go to verse 15. It says, the sons of Kohath will carry these things, but they must not touch the holy things. Because you touch them with your bare hands, you die. You notice what we do in the sanctuary over here, how we've been wearing gloves? Interesting, right? There's all this stuff you think about, it has an Old Testament reference. Okay, so in any case, uh, then, so they continue. We have descriptions of that. Then in chapter five, it talks about what you do with unclean people, that they have to be put out of the camp 
for a period of time because uh, we don't want to infect the camp. This is a spiritual as well as a physical reality, saying if sin has happened, we don't want to accept that within the community, but also if you're sick, right, we don't want you to infect everybody. So there's a very clear distinction between, a very clear connection between sin and disease, because remember, they both come from the same source. Original sin brings about all sickness, right? So there's that kind of mystical connection that's going on there. We see laws about what they do to make up for crimes. And then we have this kind of odd law, if you will, about uh, just testing a wife who is suspected of being an adulteress. And it seems a little unfair, because uh, if you'll notice, uh, the dude doesn't have any test for him, but the wife does, right? But if you look at the way the test works, it's actually pretty merciful, because in pagan culture, if a wife was suspected of adultery, they would put her to the test in the river. And if she survived, then she was innocent, right? So she presumed guilty until proven innocent. In the law here, it takes the judgment out of man's hands and says, she will drink this drink that we have blessed or cursed by God. And if she swells, it's God's judgment on her. So it basically says, it can't just be a jealous husband who's saying things. We take it out of his hands and leave it up to God to reveal it. So it's actually kind of genius because it's, it's sort of realizing there's a lot of jealous dudes out there that might be saying stuff just to say stuff. And so it's trying to take it away. So we see a movement toward a more just society with this law. Anyway, then we have about the Nazarites. And this is just only interesting in chapter 6 because it talks about if someone's making a vow, they stay away from wine and strong drink, and they don't shave their heads. right? And then we'll see this is what Samson does. He's a Nazarite from birth and also John the Baptist, a Nazarite from birth. That's why they all look so woolly and crazy, right? Because they never shave <laughs> and they don't drink strong drink and they're consecrated completely to the Lord. So that's kind of an interesting thing there. All right. So now we come to chapter seven. And now chapter seven through 10, we have preparations for them leaving because right now they're still at the base of Mount Sinai. They haven't left anywhere yet. Um, and so they're getting ready to leave. And what they do is they have 12 days of offerings. Each tribe offers a sacrifice once per day. And who's the first one to do it? The tribe of Judah. And the one who does it in verse 7, verse 12, it says, Nashon, the son of Aminadab of the tribe of Judah. Do you, that name sound familiar? Go to Matthew chapter 1. He's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, right? So right there we have the first offering is one of the descendants of the Lord. So or one of the antecedents of the Lord. Okay. So then the 12 tribes, they each offer a sacrifice. And at the end of that sacrifice, we come to verse 89. It's a very long chapter. And Moses goes to the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord. He heard the voice of the Lord speaking above the mercy seat. So after that sacrifice, the Lord reveals himself to the people. And then they pack up everything. Uh, they offer Passover, which is the first time they offered Passover outside of Egypt. It's a year later since they've left Egypt. And so now they offer Passover, and now they're going to leave and go to the promised land. So things look great, right? Sounds awesome, but right away the complaining starts. Okay, so chapter 11. The people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed outlying parts of the camp. People cried to Moses. Moses prayed to the Lord. The fire abated. So the name of that place was called Tabera because the fire of the Lord burned among them. And you think, oh, okay, well, that's, that's good. They probably learned their lesson, right? <laughs> and now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And so the people of Israel wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Oh, man, garlic. I had that yesterday. That was so good. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. Come on. Right? Bread from heaven, nothing to look at. That's pretty insulting, right? They're going to get more insulting later, right? <laughs> um, <coughs> in any case, um, Moses hears them weeping, and then Moses complains. So the spirit of complaining, not just them. Now he's like, God, why did you give me these people? And then he says famously, I love this, how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs, which, oh, sorry. No, that's, that's what he said. Darn it, where'd it go? Oh, shoot, I, I skipped ahead. I apologize. Okay, I got lost. There we go. Okay, so Moses says in, in chapter 11, verse 14, I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden's too heavy. If you deal thus with me, kill me at once. Okay. That's the great prayer of leaders who are overburdened. Please kill me right now, okay? Um, and then you repent afterwards. Okay, don't kill me. Please just help me. Okay. <laughs> I've done that a few times, right? And so then the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, who you know to be elders, and take them to the tent of meeting. I will come down and talk with you. I will take some of the spirit which is upon you, put it on them, 
and they shall bear the burden with you. So 70 elders are brought to Moses, but a couple remain in the camp. But the Holy Spirit comes down upon them and they prophesy. So God comes down upon them in a cloud. They start speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there's two dudes in the tent in the, tent in the camp who didn't come out for whatever reason. I guess they were late. They were in the bathroom or something. I don't know. You know, they're not coming out yet. But they're prophesying too. They're not with the group, but they're prophesying also. And Joshua says, stop them. They're not with us. Do you notice that a little bit where the disciples, remember hearing that when they're like, hey, there's people driving out demons in your name. They're not with us. Stop them. This is an interesting passage, and it's kind of scandalous a little bit, but, but God, right, and we're going to see it with Balaam, because Balaam's an interesting dude. He's a pagan, but he has the spirit of prophecy. It's like God can operate wherever he wants. And wherever you see God operating, you shouldn't stop it. Now, it doesn't mean you should join them, right? <laughs> you should be within the group, but the fact of the matter is, is that we shouldn't negate what God is doing, even if it's not happening in our group. Isn't that a good message? It's a good word, right? Because God... There are legitimate elements of sanctification that are happening in other churches, in other faiths, in other places. It doesn't mean they have the fullness of the truth, right? But it does mean that in this particular area, God's operating. Yes? Okay? So we can always celebrate that, but also say there's more, right? Because we don't want them to just have a little taste. We want them to have the wholeness. We want them to be in the group, okay? All right, so then Moses responds, Would, are you jealous for my sake? This is verse 29. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and don't we see that happening later on in the Acts of the Apostles, that the Holy Spirit is just given to everybody who wants it, right? And that's, in fact, the reality we live in now, that you're called to be a prophetic people, right? What was just given to Moses, what was just given to the 70, you are now the 70. You are the 72 that are set out on mission, right? Woo! Awesome. Okay. So that's really great. But what's really great before then, or not before then, uh, after the 70 elders, um, but before they are uh, inspired, the, the people are complaining, we want meat. And God says, I will provide meat, right? There's 600,000 people there, Moses says in verse 21. The people among whom I am are 600,000 on foot. And you said, I will give them meat. And they'll eat a whole month until it's coming out of their ears. And he says this, shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to satisfy them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to satisfy them? Does that sound like another complaint you've heard somewhere? Lord, where are we going to get food to feed all these people? What if a hundred days' wages wouldn't be enough to give them a little bit? Is it the same God? Yes, it is. Woo! <laughs> so the miraculous quail. I'm just putting types over here because there's a running list of types. I hope you've seen them. But like the quail is a type, right, of the feeding of the five thousand because it's like boom. Just I, food's not a problem for me. I'm God. I can make that happen, right? Okay. But because they were complaining and because they are disordered in their passion for it, so that they're just eating it raw and chomping down on it and not even cooking it. <laughs> Right? While the meat was still yet between their teeth, in verse 33, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord kindled against the people, and the Lord struck them with a great plague. Right? So it's saying that even when the Lord's giving them something, they're behaving like pigs, and they're not being grateful to God for the gift. Right? So we see again, complaining leads to death, and ingratitude leads to death. Why do you think we have a mass that is called Eucharistia, which is thanksgiving, because the fundamental thing we need to do is be thankful, because when we forget who our God is, we don't thank anyone. We think we're owed it. I deserve God to do stuff for me. No, you don't. <laughs> I am a worm <laughs> and an ant in comparison to God, and thank God he cares for me. Thank God his love is poured out for me, right? I don't deserve it. And that's why it's so incredible. That's why our act of thanksgiving just overflows, because we realize we don't deserve any of it. But yet he gives it. Awesome. Okay. And in fact, how merciful he is, right? That even after all of these rebellions, he still pours out his grace. We could have wiped him out. Okay. All right. Now, this complaining and this murmuring goes all the way to the top, because now... Aaron and Miriam are complaining. So Moses' own siblings now are complaining. It's like, hey, God talks to him all the time. That's not fair. He should talk to us. Right? Uh, do you hear that sometimes? Like, oh, who's that pope that he is? Or who's that bishop that he is? Right? Uh, God, God talks to all of us, right? We don't need him. Right? Hmm, interesting. What's the punishment for that? And what's interesting is, is Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, <laughs> Miriam, you know how, what kind of a day it's been? It's a, like, so I didn't notice I wasn't wearing my collar until like midday. <laughs> and no one stopped me. It was great. Anyway, so that's what kind of day it is. Okay. Aaron and Miriam, uh, his siblings, speak against Moses, this is chapter 12, because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. Now, Cushites are Ethiopians. They're black, right? So basically saying, oh, you married a black woman, right? 
Whew, so racism's alive and well. Woo! <laughs> right? So it's not a new thing, right? People have always looked down at interracial marriages, even in the Old Testament, right? And so, um, but here's what God does to that situation. Um, because Miriam complained about it, God makes her super white with leprosy. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, oh, you don't like black people? I'll make you real white. Fun, huh? <laughs> God has a sense of humor, too. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, Moses then says, please don't kill her. Like, you know, please forgive her. You know, he appeals for his brother and sister and God forgives them. But she has seven days of penance outside the camp and then she is cleansed and they can continue on their journey. Now they come to the promised land in chapter 13. And we're like, oh boy, now they're going to finally enter, right? Nope. They send spies into the land, one from each of the tribes. And the majority report of 10 of them say, this is terrible. The land will eat us alive. They're like giants and we're grasshoppers. And Joshua and Caleb say, no, no, it's fine. God's going to be with us. And who do they listen to? Not the good guys. Okay. So all of them in chapter 14, all the congregation raised a loud cry. The people wept. And the sons of Israel murmured against Moses. That murmuring, complaining, happened again. And they said, would that we died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we died in the wilderness. Why does the Lord bring us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? You're like, are you just absolutely, I mean, like, I mean, okay, so leave me alone. I'll just wipe them all out myself, right? That's the feeling that, that we should be having right now because he has been so good to them, liberating them time and time and time again, doing incredible miracles, miracle, miracle, miracle. And they're like, God's going to totally kill us. He's going to let us die here. He could have let you die like 15 times and he didn't. What do you, makes you think he's going to do it now? Isn't that interesting how perverse the heart is? And we're like, we judge them so quickly. But isn't it true that we do exactly the same thing? We've seen God working in our life so many times, and yet we get anxious. We get discouraged. We get angry. Oh, where is God? I mean, gosh, he didn't, he didn't save my grandma. Obviously, he doesn't love me. It's like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Right? We focus on the bad stuff and we don't focus on the incredible blessing of God. There's a lot of lessons here. We have to move on. So God, of course, responds the way uh, that we would because uh, that's, it's just and right that he would do that. Um, the Lord says in verse 11, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs which I wrought among them? I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Did he do that before? Right on the mountain, right at the golden calf instant, he said, let me alone. I will destroy them and start over with you. And now it's happening again. I will destroy them and wipe over and, and start over with you. But Moses intercedes for them again. He says, Lord, if you kill them in the wilderness, the Egyptians will laugh at you. And the whole, all the world will laugh at you. Right? God knows this, by the way. This is not information to him. He's seeing what Moses will do, right? He's seeing if Moses will step up to the plate or if Moses will let his anger take over him too. God is trying to draw out of Moses to be a Jesus figure, trying to draw out of him his best characters, and Moses rises to the occasion. What does he do? He shows the way forward. He says, I beg you, this is verse 17, I beg you, let the power of the Lord be great as you promised, saying, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon children from the third and the fourth generation. That was God's name when he revealed it to Moses. He says, I want to see your glory. He says, you come up, I'll show you my back. And then God proclaimed his name. So Moses, using the word of God, he remembered God's promises. And by remembering God's promises, that's what brings about God's blessing, right? So then God, of course, has mercy like he was planning on all along. The Lord said in verse 20, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, none of those men who saw my glory and my signs and put me to the proof these 10 times will enter the promised land. He's like, I'll save you. I'll spare them, but these people are not going to enter. Their kids will, though. Their kids will, but not them. They've lost the privilege. Okay, so now the 40 years in the desert will be the purification of the second generation so that they would be ready to enter the gift of God. Okay, all right. So that's, that's the rest of that chapter. And then we see that the spies who brought the evil report, they die, right? Because they spoke against the Lord. And then 
the people immediately after that, they said, oh no, hey, hey, let's go into the promised land. No, it's just kidding, just kidding, let's go into the promised land. And Moses like, you guys, that, that ship has sailed. Do not go into the promised land. You will not make it. And they're like, no, no, we can, we can totally do it, right? And they go in and they don't make it. So, so then they finally go out into the desert. There's a few more laws that are given. Realize that every fall, there are more laws that are given. That's why we have a break from the story and we get a few more laws introduced, right? And one of the laws that are here are basically the difference between venial and mortal sins. And so you can offer sacrifice with venial sins, but mortal sins cause death. And it's like, wow, that's really shocking. But yeah, mortal means it's life or death, right? So it, it's saying, yeah, if you commit a sin willingly, knowing that it's wrong, the penalty is death. And that's, in fact, the spiritual reality of all of our lives. Just now it's delayed, right? We don't experience it right away. But in fact, that's the case if we die in mortal sin not having repented, we will not see eternal life. So this was a penitential measure to show them the reality of our spiritual lives, that we need to make sure we're never intentionally sinning. We always, if we're sinning, it should be by accident. Because if we don't love God enough to avoid sin, we're perverse. We don't realize the gift we've been given and we need to repent, right? Okay, so now we come to this spicy stuff. This is uh, chapter 16, where we see the sons of the Korathites. Remember the group of Levites that were the holy ones, right? They're stirring up a rebellion, and they get the sons of Reuben to come along with them because Reuben's the firstborn, remember? So they're like, okay, we're going to gang up on Moses and take the priesthood for ourselves, right? So this is what they say. This is in chapter 16, verse 3. They assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you've gone too far. All the congregation are holy, every one of them, right? The Lord is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? You ever heard that before? Yeah, why are priests so special? What do you think you are? We're all holy, right? We're all holy priests of Jesus Christ, right? Why do we need you? I've heard this, right? And sadly, that was a theology that was proclaimed within the Catholic Church for the last, you know, 30, 40 years, is that the priests are nothing special. There's no need for them, really. That's Martin Luther, gotta say. <laughs> Lutheranism rejected the priesthood, that there's nothing except baptism, that we're all on the same plane and we don't need priests. It's actually a lie. It's not true. The fact is we are all priests, but we're a different kind of priests, right? And the Second Vatican Council teaches that very clearly. The priesthood of the faithful and the priesthood of the ordained differs in de not just in degree, but in kind. It is a different kind of priesthood, just as a different kind of priesthood in the Old Testament between the Levites, the laity, if you will, that weren't Levites, and Aaron and his sons. There was a distinction that was there. So Moses, of course, he, he decides we're going to do a trial by fire. We're all going to take incense, and whoever... The Lord responds to, that's who the real priests are, right? We'll let the Lord decide, right? And so here's what happens. Of course, uh, at the end of 16, chapter 16, verse 25, Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. He said to the congregation, depart, I beg you, from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins. And so the people who listen, they get away from them, Korah, Dathan and Abiram, they're there with their families around their tents. And then Moses delivers this word. This is in verse 29. If these men die the common death of men or they're visited by the fate of all men, the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new and the ground opens up and swallows them with all that belongs to them and they go alive into Sheol, you will know these men have despised the Lord. And then as soon as he finished speaking, the ground under them split asunder. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, all the men that belonged to them and all their goods. And fire came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. Whew. So there's pretty clear, like, okay, these guys are not the priests. Okay? Now you think after that, everyone would be fine with it. But of course, the next day, verse 41, all the congregation of the sons of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You killed the people of the Lord! <laughs> Did you not see what happened? Like, Moses had nothing to do with that. <laughs> That was pretty supernatural, but they're like, no, you're murdering the people, right? And so then they're trying to stone them. You see the audacity, right, of that? And so then the Lord's glory appears and a plague strikes out and kills 14,000 people, right? So it's like, okay, guys, if you're not getting it, I'm going to beat it through your skulls. And then Moses and Aaron, the only reason it stops is because they offer sacrifice of atonement for them. So there's actually more people die after this than died at the base of Mount Sinai for the golden calf. Think about how important... The Lord is saying the priesthood is and his anointed ones are. That's not being self-serving. That's just a reality of saying we need to understand what the priesthood is and what its purpose is to understand why God takes it so seriously. Okay. All right. So then it continues. And then they still don't acknowledge that Aaron is the high priest. 
because go figure, they're really dense. And so they have a test where they take all the leaders' rods, they take a rod for each house, and they put it in the tabernacle, and they mark them with their tribe's names, and then Aaron's rod blooms, and none of the others do. So God's making it very clear, okay, Aaron's rod is blooming supernaturally, his is the priesthood, and no one else's. So then the case is closed. Okay. And the rod of Aaron is now put in the Ark of the Covenant along with the manna and the Ten Commandments. So now the Ark contains the sign of the high priest, the bread from heaven, and the law. Which is why Our Lady is called the Ark of the New Covenant, because in her womb is Jesus Christ, the true high priest, the bread from heaven, and the eternal word made flesh. Woo! And of course, the Ark being brought into battle and all enemies are destroyed, Mary, the new Ark, being brought into battle and conquers and crushes the head of the serpent. Yes! Anyway, sorry, I just get too ahead of myself. You see how the Old Testament is so amazing? We miss so much of our Catholic life because we do not know the first five books of the Bible. 80% of what we do as Catholics has its foundational roots theologically here. It's, 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 it's formational kind of material that we need to know. Then, of course, we see that in chapter 18, talks about the priests, that they handle the holy things, they offer sacrifice, the people give them tithes because they don't have an inheritance in the promised land. So how are they going to live? The people each need to give a portion to the priests for their sustenance. So that's how the system works, right? You know, I don't have another job, and you guys support me, and that's how it works. You know, I support you, and I offer sacrifice to you, and you guys support me, and you support the mission ministry of the church. That's the way it's always been, right? And then it says you have no inheritance in the land or in a portion among them because I am your portion. God is your portion. As if you're a priest, God needs to be your portion. So that's why we rightly are incensed when we see priests living really worldly lives or bishops who live like princes or kings because it's not what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be relying on the Lord and living for him. Okay. So if you're called to be a priest or religious, the idea is you need to live gospel, simplicity, and poverty so that you don't um, cause scandal to the people of God. Right? And we see several examples of priests throughout the rest of the Old Testament who cause grave scandal. We'll come to those stories later. Okay, where are we at right now? Okay, well, good. We're still going to be able to do this. All right, great. So now we're in chapter 20. Um, we have the waters of Meribah, which, of course, now is another time of complaining because there's no water. We've seen this before, though, where there's no water, right? That was before they were coming to Sinai, so we know that God can fix that problem. But they complain again, right? <laughs> Because that's the theme. That's what they do. So this is verse 2. They assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron. The people contended with Moses and said, Would that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. So now they're saying, We wish we would have been swallowed up when our brothers died. It's like, you guys are so... Like, every time you say, Would that we have died, usually they're going to die. <laughs> so I would think after like the fifth time that it happened, you would be like, Keep your mouth shut. Because you're probably going to die. Right? <laughs> At this time, surprisingly, they don't, right, yet, but they will. <laughs> and so the Lord then, Moses and Aaron, went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent, fell on their faces. The glory of the Lord appeared to them. Take the rod, assemble the congregation, you and your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So interesting, you take the rod, but you don't strike it. Because remember, he struck the rock before. Now he's saying take the rod, but speak to it, and it will bring forth water. Interesting. Difference, detail. Moses took the rod from the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his rod twice. So not just once, but twice. Now it's interesting, right? The water then comes forth abundantly, and the congregation drank and their cattle. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I've given them. So now Moses and Aaron will not enter the promised land because of this one thing. You have to ask the question, what is going on here? Right? It's very weird. But we've seen, right, that Moses has been um, kind of rebellious against God since the beginning, hasn't he? Right? He's like, send someone else. I ah, can't do it, can't do it. Whatever. Now, he's seen a lot of things, hasn't he? He's seen God do tremendous things. And in fact, how did the sons of Korah and Abiram die? What did he do? He said, if this doesn't happen, then I'm a false prophet. But if the earth opens up, by his word, the earth opened up. So 
why didn't he speak to the rock, have it open up? Because he has a hard heart too. And you're like, how can that be? It's a warning to all of us. Even if you have seen hundreds of miracles, even if you have worked hundreds of miracles, if you don't constantly live in obedience to the Lord and in reliance upon him, you can fall. What does he say? Will we bring forth water from the rock? Can he bring forth water from the rock? Weird. Isn't that odd? Pride, anger, self-righteousness, all these things, seeing all of these things, being rightly incensed about them because it's an unjust situation. They keep complaining against God. But in that moment, his anger leads to self-reliance. And he knows that water's come out before by striking it. So let's go with what works. Interesting, huh? I find that to be just chilling and a good warning to us to remind ourselves to just rely upon him because otherwise we too will not enter the promised land. So now Aaron dies um, because he's of old age and dies uh, on the border. And then after this, the sin of, of Meribah, we have the bronze serpent. So we have the story of the seraph serpents um, because the people are complaining again. All right. So this is chapter 21, verse 4. They set out by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And people became impatient. Along the way, the people spoke against God and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Again, we didn't bring you up here to die in the wilderness. We brought you to bring you to the promised land, right? It says, For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So remember before they said there's nothing here but this manna to look at. Now they're calling the manna worthless food the bread from heaven you're calling it worthless food eeks right do you hear that so that's why the punishment is so severe god sends flaming serpents it says literally the seraphim have you heard that before the fiery angels right it's the same word flaming the burning ones those who are the closest to god are the seraphim the angels that are right around his presence it's the same word for these snakes that when they bite, their poison burns, right? And that's why we also see the devil, like the idea that the devil was a seraphim who fell, and, right? And his fire burns, right? So he is, the, he is the fiery serpent par excellence, right? But in any case, um, the people repent, kind of. It says, we've sinned, spoken against the Lord. Please pray to God. And the Lord says, make a fiery serpent, make a seraph and set it on a pole. And everyone who's bitten... When he sees it, will live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it up as a sign. And if the serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is really fabulously interesting, isn't it? Because didn't God command them to make no graven images? Why are we making a graven image? Because the commandment about making graven images wasn't about just making any statues at all. It was about making statues of God. Right? This image becomes a sacramental and in fact, it becomes a type because just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that anyone who looks upon him will be saved from the fiery serpent bite of sin. Right? So it's a mystery to the Jewish people. The bronze serpent is weird to them. They don't understand why God said to do that. And it only becomes clear when the cross is manifested in the New Testament, what it was for. See how it's, it's, really, it's really just fascinating, all these things that just they don't make sense until Jesus comes and his light illuminates all the pages behind. Because you're just seeing the shadows until you see who's causing the shadows. And then you realize, oh, that's what that was for. The shadow of the cross illumines this very bizarre story of a bronze serpent lifted on a pole that heals those who are bitten by flaming serpents. Interesting. Then they defeat a few people. They defeat Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan. You hear them over and over again in the Psalms. So when you hear those names, just realize that, that this is kind of famous battles. And now we come to the story of Balaam. And Balaam is a fascinating dude because he's a pagan uh, prophet, as we said. He's hired by the king of Midian because he sees Og, the king of Bashan, and uh, this uh, a Sion, the king of the Amorites, have both been defeated, and he's like, we're next, I need help. So he calls Balaam to the rescue, 1-800-curse-people, uh, and that's what he does. And so he's like, okay, curse these, these Israelites for me. And Balaam was, of course, well-known because his prayers were powerful and his curses were powerful. 
but he says, I can only listen to what God says. So he's kind of an interesting guy. He listens to God, but he also does magic. So again, he's not a guy you want to imitate, but somehow God uses him for this one instance, right? And so what's funny is we have, of course, the story of the talking donkey. This is not Shrek, but this is real life, okay? And what, so, so he's on his way, and there's an angel sent to kill him, and the donkey turns aside, and he's beating the donkey, and the donkey's like, why are you hitting me? And he's like, because you don't do what I tell you to do. Have I ever disobeyed you? No. And why are you talking? <laughs> and then God opens his eyes and he sees the angel. And the angel says, you will go to my people Israel, but you will only say what God says. You better really not be motivated by money. You better really listen up because I got something to say. And so Balaam then has four blessings. Instead of cursing, he tries to curse them. And four times he ends up blessing them. And the last time he blesses them, it's a blessing about the Messiah. And very clearly. Almost died there. His fourth oracle says, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in latter days. This is chapter 24, verse 15. He took up this discourse. said, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of a man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, this is a vision of the Almighty, falling down but having his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It will crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Get chills, you hear that? It's like Christmas story. <laughs> right? Ah, man, so you see? Out of the mouths of donkeys, right? <laughs> God can use literally anyone, anything to proclaim his glory. That's the good news, right? Because God made everything, didn't he? And God can use everything for his glory and anyone for his glory. Okay. Now, we just think it's so great, but now we come to the, the right at the border of the, holy, of, of the promised land to a place called Baal of Peor. And this is, uh, this is uh, where the second generation really botches it. We've had 40 years go by. It's now the second generation. They're better, right? Nope. Uh, at the instigation of Balaam, he encourages the Midianite women to seduce the men to come to their worship services. Like, oh, come to church with us and we'll have prostitution. It'll be nice. And so they do, right? And so they, they worship false gods and they engage in all sorts of orgy-like practices. And so they are just like their ancestors with the golden calf. And the only reason that the plague stops from wiping all of them out is because one man, Phineas, when he sees somebody taking a prostitute into the tabernacle, he goes in and slays them both out of holy zeal. And because of that, Phineas, this man, he receives the priesthood, just like the Levites received the priesthood for acting with zeal for the Lord's holiness. Right? So the second generation has shown themselves to be no better than the first. Um, and now we get the second census of Israel, a few more laws, a few more offerings, um, war against Midian where Balaam is, is killed. Um, and then there's a warning that's given to the Israelites that as they enter into the promised land, they better make sure that they better drive out everybody. Because if they don't drive out everyone, they're going to remain and be a snare to you. This will be a theme later. It's spiritually significant. It's saying when you want to enter into the promised land, you can't make any partnership with sin. You have to drive it all out of your life. Because if you leave one area, you're like, oh, I can have that sometimes. It's okay. It's not that bad. It will get you, right? So it's a spiritual allegory. Okay, so before we go uh, to our small groups, I'll just give you a brief overview of the covenantal thing that's happened here just as a sort of a reminder of the story. So we started, remember, at Sinai where God gave the covenant, gave the law. There was the first fall with the golden calf. Then it's renewed with the book of Leviticus, but more laws are added and we have the priesthood. Then there's the second fall because they refuse to enter into the promised land. And so as penance for that, they get more laws and they're forced to wander in the desert and we get the book of Numbers. And the first generation dies. Okay? And then we think it's all good because it's been renewed there. It's great. 40 years pass by. And then, of course, this is the fall with the Baal of Peor. And the consequence of that is going to be the book of Deuteronomy, which we will cover next time next year. So, if we break up into our small groups um, and our CIA, our CIA is meeting tonight, yes, correct? Okay, Lisa is leading our CIA, so those who are in our CIA, they can go with her. You guys have a special presentation, you don't need my questions, correct? Okay, so all you guys, you don't worry about my questions, that's fine. Um, for those who are doing uh, questions or with your small groups, I had a couple of suggestions for you. The first is 
What's one new thing you learned tonight? That one's always a gimme. You can use that one. The other is, are you starting to notice, this one's fun, are you starting to notice any connections before we talk about them in class? What have you noticed this last time? Or how is your experience of mass changing because of your study of the Old Testament? So that's uh, these last couple of times. And then the last one is just if you think, why is Israel complaining all the time even when it was killing them? Do you see any lessons for us to how we can avoid complaining? So, and all the youth are up here with me. Okay. We can talk about whatever you want. I, that's fine. You, you can ask any questions you want. But those are some suggestions. Yeah. Middle school over here up front, high school over here. Boop. Thank you.
Now it is. <laughs> okay. So a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And you will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. They were proclaiming, she was proclaiming that message in a language that the Aztecs could understand. Right? But we have to ask the question, is this new God, this baby God, going to be any better than the other gods, the sun and the moon? And the answer is yes. And how do we know? Because we look at her, and there's where your answer comes in. She's not looking straight at you. She's looking down. If you look straight at somebody in Aztec culture, it's an aggressive, it's an aggressive posture. If somebody's staring you down, it's aggressive, right? So the fact is the gods, they looked you straight in the eye. They're warlike. They would look you right in the eye. That means I'm coming for you, right? I'm going to get you. She's looking down, which means I come in peace. I come in humility. Her son is the prince of peace. Right? So just by those simple things, they knew that the God she was carrying in her womb was going to be a God of peace. Now, the Aztecs believed every 52 years there was a new God that was born because they worshipped the sun and the stars. And the solar calendar and the lunar calendar lined up every 52 years. And exactly at that time is the time when this image appears. So they're awaiting a new God to be born. And here he is. And he's going to be the one who replaces all their other gods. Mary is also clothed in the stars whom they worshipped. And what's so cool about this is that the stars are actually constellations that were visible on December 12th at exactly the moment she appeared. Five minutes later, five minutes earlier, it would have been different constellations. It's exactly the time. And we can actually use computer programming. We can go back and we can see what constellations were visible above Mexico City at that time. These are exactly the same constellations, the exact same formation. However, not from our perspective. They're from the perspective of the sun. And the sun is right here over her womb. Ah! Isn't that awesome? That is so cool, right? Because you would have to be an amazing astronomer to know that. And in fact, the Europeans were not very good by comparison to the Aztecs. The Aztecs were way better astronomers than the Europeans were in the 16th century because they worshipped the stars, so they, they knew them very well. And so that's why all the pagan priests, when they looked at this, they saw immediately, oh, the sun is her womb, her baby. The true sun that we worship, that's him. And how do we know it's the Christian God? Because around her neck she's wearing a little brooch that has a cross on it. It's like, oh, the God that the Spanish people brought over, that's this God that they've been telling us about. That's who it is. Right? Now, the question is, is he a God for us? That's another question. Is he somebody who's like us? And the answer is yes, because she's a mestiza lady. She's a mixed race lady. If you look really closely, she looks white. You zoom up, she's a mixed race lady. So we see that both the Spaniards and the Mexicans, the native indigenous, could call her their mother. So I'm going to be the mother of all of you, and my son is going to be your brother. You see all this crazy, amazing stuff? And then we see on her dress, there's a lot of different flowers, which have spiritual significance, but they, each flower represented each one of the different tribes of the Aztecs. So saying, this is the mother of all the tribes that are present in Mexico right now. And if you lay it flat over a map of Mexico, a topographical map, each one of the flowers lines up with the mountain peaks of Mexico. Isn't that cool? Uh, I'm just geeking out. Guys, you don't understand how amazing this is. Okay, the angel here below, of course, is dressed like a catechumen, like those who are preparing for baptism. So the angel is supposed to be Juan Diego, who is uh, the messenger of Guadalupe, right, of Our Lady. But what's amazing, friends, is that this image, the original, is scientifically impossible. Scientifically impossible. I don't know if you know this or not. Um, Do you know what it's made of? Yes. It's made of cactus fiber. Have you ever made cactus stuff? Have you ever done basket weaving? Okay. Um, Plant material decomposes after a few years. We do not have any cactus fibers from the 16th century. None survived. In fact, cactus weave doesn't last more than 40 years in the best of conditions in climate-controlled rooms. We have tried to make replicas of the tilma, and every one of them completely decomposes in less than 40 years. And that's in a climate-controlled room. For the first 100 years, the tilma was exposed without glass, and the people touched it. Millions of people touched it. 10 million people, no, 8 million people became Catholic in 10 years. You had literally hundreds of thousands of people touching it every single month, touching their rosaries to it, nuzzling their face in it, weeping on it. I mean, you've seen crazy people touch stuff, right? I mean, like, I mean, you've, you've seen it, right? It's like, oh, you know, they're touching things and bringing the rosaries, and your abuela is like, oh, you know? So, I mean, you know how crazy people get around holy stuff. And that's what they were doing all day long. All day long, touching it, touching it, touching it, human oils. If you touch paint, you touch 
you know, is that why you go to art museums? Do they let you touch the paintings? No, because if you touch it with your oils in your hands, you're going to destroy it, right? People have been touching this thing for a hundred years, and there was no sign of aging whatsoever. It was exposed to smoke, incense, candles, bugs, humidity, for a hundred years before they put it behind glass. And it's still around 500 years later. Art historians have examined it. It is not aged at all. Some people say it's a constant body temperature when they touch it. But the fact of the matter is, friends, there's no reason for it to be around unless some power outside of it is keeping it around. Because we can't explain how it even exists. Oh, and it's indestructible. There's a really cool thing. You can't really see it on this one because it's kind of in the little this frame here, but you can see it on this one. Hold this, please. Thank you. In the 18th century, in the 1700s, they were cleaning it, and some ding-dong took nitric acid that they were cleaning the silver frame around it with, and they spilled it. And they spilled it all over the image. Now, nitric acid will eat through clothes like that, okay? It should have completely burned a hole in the Tilma instantly. All you can see is a slight discoloration right up here. That's what this water spot looks like. That was nitric acid. That's the only damage that has ever been done to the Tilma in its 500 year history, okay? Then in the 20th century, in the 1920s, there was a communist who took a vase of flowers and had a bomb in it and put it right in front of the altar where Our Lady was. The bomb went off, it blew up the marble altar, right, a solid marble altar, it just blew it apart. It threw the huge crucifixes and candlesticks across the room. If you go, how many of you have been to Mexico City? Have you been to the Guadalupe Shrine? A few people, right? If you go to the museum, you can see the crucifix, it's bent over like this, forward, not backward. The crucifix bent over to shield the bomb. It's like, ugh, just gives me the chills. Like it bent forward, not backward. Anyway, so, and then, of course, it blew out all the windows of the cathedral, and it, of the basilica, and it blew out the windows of all the houses a few blocks around. It didn't even scratch the glass of the image that was right above the altar. And this was before the invention of bulletproof glass. It was invented for another 10 or 15 years. Oh, but there's more. You want more? Ah, oh, it's so good. There's so much more. The cool thing is, is that it's a cactus fiber weave, right? So if you were to lift it up to the, to the light, you would see light coming through it because it's like your sweater, like a knit sweater, okay? There's no paint on it because to paint on that, you would have to put primer on it and it would block up all the holes. There is no primer. There's no paint. They've analyzed it with infrared photography. There are no brush strokes. They took a couple threads and they gave it to a German chemist, a Nobel Prize chemist. They didn't tell him where it came from. They just said, analyze these colored threads for us. And you know what he said? Uh, there's no dye on them, Met vegetable, mineral, any kind of pigment that I can tell. They're simply colored threads and I don't know how. Right? Pretty amazing stuff. Oh, and it's on both sides because the threads are colored. So it's like, turn it over. There she is. <laughs> Literally every single thread is the color that you see. Oh, and did you notice this? There's a cool thing down the middle. You'll notice how it looks kind of like, ah, these roses are beautiful, but they're in my way. Um, you know how, uh, you see this, how it's kind of like a seam right here? Th that line right there? It actually is a seam. It's actually two pieces. It's two pieces that are held together by one single cactus thread that weaves around up here. And it is held up against the weight it has not torn in 500 years. That I think is more amazing than anything else. It's a single thread that is weaving those two pieces together and holding them together. And the weight of that should have torn it a long time ago. Cool, huh? Oh, but there's more. <laughs> if you turn it sideways. You know how Juan Diego heard music? When he, when he heard music? If you turn it this way, and you put musical staves over it, it plays a song. Do you want to hear it? Oh, man, I can't play it right now. But uh, somebody, somebody has it. Do you, have, you, have you looked it up before? Do you know where it is? OK. Um, we'll have Lupe send you the QR code so you can listen to it. It's pretty amazing. It sounds very heavenly and ethereal. And uh, what's amazing is they tried to figure out if this would work on copies, it doesn't work. Any copies, well, any ones they tried to make paintings of because the stars are in different positions, it doesn't work. And then they tried 
Remember how I said this constellation was exactly how it appeared at that moment when Our Lady appeared? They tried changing it slightly, the constellations, if it was five minutes later or five minutes earlier. And it doesn't sound harmonious anymore. It's like literally that moment when Our Lady appeared, there's music. Isn't that awesome? I love it. Anyway, it's so great. So, um, oh, oh, and by the way, <laughs> this is the kicker, and we still don't understand this one yet. This is kind of new and exciting, and we don't understand it. But you know how little those eyeballs are? See those eyes? They're, they're 11 millimeters in diameter. They took an ophthalmoscope, you know, the ophthalmologist, when they do like eye doctor stuff and they looked at it, they zoomed it up thousands of times. They found 13 images of people in one eye. They're in both eyes. 13 images of people, and they've identified them, a few of them. It looks like at the moment that the tilma was revealed, it was like a photo, Our Lady's eyes, everyone who was in the room was captured in her eyes. Isn't that awesome? Do you see why I like her so much? You guys, you need to know your story because she is amazing. This is the greatest ongoing miracle in the Catholic Church today other than the Eucharist. You have to recognize this. There are two things in the world right now, actually there's, there's three potentially, that scientists have examined exhaustively for a long time, and they have come to the conclusion that they are not made by human beings. This is one of them. The other one is the Shroud of Turin. It was the burial shroud that believed that wrapped Jesus. Those two things, scientists do not know how to make them. They cannot reproduce it with 21st century technology. We cannot make this today with the same categoristics. We cannot do it. Because first of all, you'd have to paint something on a surface that can't be painted. Uh, it would have to survive longer than 40 years. Um, and we just don't know how it would have to be indestructible and survive nitric acid and a bomb and um, by a constant human body temperature and create music and um, you know, be theologically and spiritually and artistically the most amazing piece that's been known to man. Is the Catholic faith cool or what? Our Lady is amazing. And you see, friends, she is the star of the new evangelization because she's the most effective proclaimer of the gospel in the history of the world. Not St. Paul, not St. Francis Xavier, not any of the saints. All the saints put together do not hold a candle to what she did in 10 years. She converted a whole country in 10 years. And a culture that was as perverse as ours is. So if you look at our world and you say it's really messed up, how can things ever change? This is the secret weapon. Remember we talked about the Ark of the Covenant coming in and destroying the enemies of Israel? She is the true Ark, and she will bring about the healing of the world if we let her. But we all have to put ourselves under her mantle. We all need to become children of Mary. We need to. Do you pray the rosary? How many of you received a rosary? Right? We gave you one, right? Okay. How many of you pray it? You need to pray it every day, friends. Our life depends upon it. And what's so amazing, I mean, look at all this. I mean, it's just, she's so beautiful, brothers and sisters. She's just amazing. I hope that you all like her because um, I just, she's, she's uh, there aren't words. If you really want to study more about this, there's a great book called Guadalupe Mysteries. And it's like a coffee table book, and it's got like high color photos and other stuff. And I have it in my office. If you anybody wants to borrow it, you want to look at it, um, it's incredible. It talks about all the scientific studies, the history, all of it. Um, because this is truly, if people don't have a hard time believing if God's real, the only thing you can say about this is either God made it or aliens made it. Those are only two options: God or aliens. What do you want to believe in? You know, I mean, really, because we don't know how to make this. And something right now is keeping it from decomposing that we can't explain. So you have to wrestle with that, right? The supernatural, we're a church of supernatural miracles. And we think if that's that amazing, look at the Eucharist, right? God is with us. And this is just what happens when you are fully given to God. This is what's possible through your intercession and prayers. Imagine what the Lord can do for you. If that's what his mom can do, imagine what he can do. 
If just a human being can do that, imagine what Jesus Christ can do if you let him. Sound good? All right. Well, we're waiting for folks to come back in. Maybe just, um, I'm going to bring out the relic of St. Alice, because you guys get a first pick at her, at her. We've, of course, had the veneration of relics a couple classes ago we did, but on her feast day, there's a lot of graces available. So if you have rosaries or scapulars or anything you want to touch to the relic of St. Alice, or if you have any physical ailments or things you need prayer for, you can just ask her to pray for you and come up and venerate the relic if you'd like to in the next couple of minutes that we have before everyone else comes back in. Can somebody help me with this real quickly, please? Thank you. Otherwise, we'll just take some quiet time in prayer and just thank God and just come up closer to Our Lady. We'll bring her over here as well, too, if you want to see some of the details I talked about. Let's just have a couple of minutes of reflection as we wait for the rest of them to come back and join us. And if you want to come up and venerate the relic, you can do that. We have the papers here to verify this is indeed a relic that comes from St. Alice. It's a piece of a bone. Um, There's a first-class relic. And, uh, and of course, St. Alice is a patron of a lot of healing of families. So if you have difficulties in your families or your marriages or among your brothers and sisters, she's really, she's really helpful in that. So feel free. People are wondering about St. Alice. We're going to talk about her tomorrow. We also have the Posadas tomorrow. So I hope you guys come tomorrow. It's going to be really good. Um, and we'll have dinner afterwards too. So, but St. Alice, she was, a, she was an empress. She was a queen. And she was married uh, to a French prince, or, and, uh, the prince or German prince, or Prince of Burgundy. And her husband was murdered. And, uh, and the husband was try- the, this guy was trying to steal the throne and so wanted to force her to marry him. And she refused, and so she was imprisoned and tortured. And then she escaped. That's kind of what that painting in the back there of St. Alice is, is kind of depicting uh, her escaping from prison. Um, she was rescued by a priest. And, uh, and then Otto I, the Holy Roman Emperor, married her, and so she became the Holy Roman Empress. Um, but he, of course, died after a few years, and so she was left a widow again, and she was left to be the empress to watch over her, ch- her son until he became of age. And when he got married, he got married to a not-so-nice lady who exiled her, and so she has suffered again because of, of marriage and family problems. But then eventually her son realized his error and came and asked for forgiveness, and they reconciled with each other, and she became a great um, patron of forgiveness and reconciliation. And she re- enriched a lot of churches. She built the Abbey of Cluny with her own resources. Um, so she she's, was a, a great patron of the church and a great uh, prayer warrior and a loving mom, right? So. if we had the question box out there or not. Um, but we'll have a couple of runners ready with microphones for Q&A. And we'll have time for veneration of the relic after uh, when we have exposition. We'll have her over here to the side as well. So don't worry, we'll kind of, we'll end with veneration here in a minute and then we'll do Q&A.
there. Why is this? The number is different. Yeah, why, yep. why is it 13 and 12? Oh, good. Yes, good question. So in your, in your RSVs, you have, in the Psalms, you have different numberings. It's because one is the Greek numbering, the other is the Latin Vulgate numbering. So there's a little different manuscript number tradition. So the Vulgate traditional numbering is in the little brackets. But it's, it's not so much used commonly by everybody. Most people go with the Greek numbering. So, yeah. So there's the Greek Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate that have different numberings for the Psalms. And so if you see the overlap in there, that's what that's about. Good. Good. Uh, questions? I got some in the, in the box. I can start with those if people don't have a question. But you keep your hand raised and they'll bring a microphone to you. We'll get questions queued up on reading a couple. Here's one. How does one know if a sin of pride, anger, sloth, etc., is venial or mortal? Um, great question. Uh, the question is whether or not you, you intended to do it or not. Because mortal sin, you have to know it's wrong and you have to do it anyway, right? So if you're like, boy, when my, when my sister gets home, I'm going to punch her right in the face, right? That's premeditated, okay? It's like, oh, that, that won't make her feel good. I don't care. I hate her. I'm going to punch her in the face, right? Mortal sin if you do it, right? Because you have a lot of time thinking about it versus maybe something happens and you just don't think about it and you accidentally do something that's different. Yes, Lupe. Can I what? It's on you. Oh, I said if you can mute it. A question about homework. Um, so here is the homework. I know some people probably haven't started yet. You don't have to raise your hand. Um, this is the opportunity for you to catch up, okay? By the time we meet next, you need to have read through Deuteronomy. So our next class, we will go through Deuteronomy. The, the difficult parts, you can skim through Deuteronomy, okay? Because there's a lot of parts, kind of like numbers, where you have just long lists of names and things. Don't worry about it. Read the story material of Deuteronomy. We will cover the other stuff that's more difficult, okay? But this is an opportunity for you to catch up. If you're behind, you have a few weeks because we don't have any class from now until the middle of January because the first time we're going to come back is healing night in January, the second Thursday. So we have a break for three weeks of, of class, right? So, so realize that, that you have time to catch up. I want you all to be praying, reading the Bible every day so you get caught up to the end of Deuteronomy by the time we hit the middle of January because if you're not caught up by then, you're really not paying attention to the class. Does that make sense? I think that's only fair. If you're not caught up to Deuteronomy by then, you kind of got to say, I'm not ready to be confirmed, okay? Because there's a lot of time to catch up. Does that sound okay to everybody? Okay, all right. But I think if we can get caught up to that and where the, that part is in the, the Bible Basics book as well, we're, we're a little bit, we've stopped kind of with the Bible Basics book because we're filling in a lot of detail the book doesn't cover, okay? So, but if you're caught up to that point, at least to the end of Deuteronomy for the Bible and for the book, the Bible Basics, then you'll be on track, okay? Sound good? Yeah, so the first time we will be back will be the healing night. And we're doing that because next week is Posadas. So I want you all to come to Posadas. That's your, that's your class. So come to Posadas and enjoy it. Actually, come tomorrow if you can. It'll be a big posada. So please, los padres, anímense para venir a los posadas porque va a ser muy bonita. Okay? Good. Excellent. That's a great question. But yes, the homework will be to finish Deuteronomy, and then we'll be getting into some fun story stuff. Okay, great. Other questions? Okay, finish that one. Are bad thoughts sin or temptation? Uh, it entirely depends. If a thought comes and you don't like it, and you're fighting it the whole time, it's temptation. If a thought comes, you're like, oh, yeah, let's see where that goes. Hey, you know, and you're playing around with it, then it's sin, okay? But temptation is something that comes from the outside that you don't want, okay? Temptation can be something you want also, but the fact is, is that if it comes from outside, you're like, where did that come from? That's weird. That's gross. I don't like it. That's temptation. You don't sin by that as long as you give it to God. If you experience temptation, what you do in that moment is say, God, you know I don't want to think that. You know I don't want to feel that. Please take it. I love you, right? The more you focus on Jesus, the more your temptations will go away quicker. Okay, good. Questions? Raise hand real high if you got one. Otherwise, I'll just go to the question box. We've got a few in here, so that's good. There's an essay. No, just kidding. Okay. Okay. I'm curious about... Okay, well, all right. Do, 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 do. All right. I'm curious about how to interact, or maybe if I should continue friendships with people who are in same-sex relationships, or trans people, or identify as different gender. I know to treat with respect, but do I continue friendship and being my child around, or be, or bring my child around the, set, the setting? Child is aware that same-sex and all above is wrong. Okay. 
Well, those are several different questions in one. Um, and, and you kind of got a good answer on it, which is saying, yeah, we love everybody. Um, we have to recognize uh, that there's going to be a lot of people who believe things that we don't agree with or who practice or do things we don't agree with, whether it's this or other things. And so we always love people. We always do, right? But we can never be in a place where we accept things that aren't true. And we have to say very clearly, a man cannot be a woman and a woman cannot be a man. This is a place of confusion in our world right now. So if we accept that as truth, then what we do is we don't have the ability to be in conversation with each other anymore. Because if I, here's, here's what we just say, if, if someone says, if I were to come to you and say, I'm a woman, right, you'd say, prove it, right? Because <laughs> I don't look like one, right? And the fact is, is that if I were to commit a crime and I left some blood behind on the scene, what would that blood say? If we would deny that and say, no, 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 it's actually a woman's blood, because I say I'm a woman, then we have lost everything. We can't live in society anymore. It's the death of our society. So there's certain things where we have to say, I can love a person because a person, if they believe that they are not their biological sex, it's a great suffering. And so we have to love that person tremendously. But love doesn't mean that we embrace the disorder that's happening in their mind where they reject their body. Because it is a sickness. It's an illness. It's called gender dysphoria. And the world has rejected it and they try and celebrate it. But why are we celebrating? We wouldn't celebrate cancer. We wouldn't celebrate any illness. We have great compassion for people with illness. We don't judge them for being sick. We don't. But we need to help them and not hurt them by encouraging fantasy. Because friends, we have to say very clearly, if you believe, if you are fully genetically a man or fully genetically a woman and you don't accept your body, it's saying there's something wrong that needs help, not surgery. Right? But that doesn't mean that you judge somebody if they get surgery. You don't, because we love everybody. We do. Right? But we would never accept lies for truth because that doesn't help anyone right so as far as whether you bring your children around certain circumstances it's to say look we live in a very difficult world and so you have to decide what is the age you're going to expose them to things right because they're going to see it eventually but you get to decide as parents when that time is and we have to make decisions about when we get kids phones or, or whether we get them at all or things like that or whether we give access to the internet or things because you have to realize I need to judge my children when they're ready to see certain things. I need to make sure I'm giving them into school systems that will protect their innocence and not abuse it, right? So it's a very complicated question. It's very difficult. The church is going to suffer a lot for this one, right? But the fact is, is that we have to because it's important. We, we, can't, we can't harm people by admitting lies. They're not true. Okay. Other questions? All right. I'm just going to keep going. Dig my own grave. All right, here we go. Why did God create humans when he knew they were going to be evil? Mmm, very good, right? Ask him. <laughs> be because, really quite amazing, see God's generosity that he wants, he, he, he believes in you so much. He believes in you so much that he's going to give you the opportunity to change. Even though he knows you won't, he still gives you the chance to do it. Because he doesn't give up on anybody. And that's really remarkable because uh, I just can't imagine that. I, I don't think that way. But that's what God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Did you have a question? Sorry. Okay. Anybody else? Good. All right. I'll just keep going. I mean, I'll, these are good questions. I don't know. If there is no good without bad, then God was not good before creation. Ah! Okay. Very good. Uh, wrong. Okay. It depends how you define bad. It depends how you define evil. Evil is not something. Evil is the lack of something. Right? Because we say God, God is perfectly good. God is not a yin-yang where he's got good and evil in him. There is no evil in God. There is no shadow in God at all. He is pure light. He is pure goodness. Right? And so where did evil come from? Remember, through the envy of the devil, sin and death entered the world. And those who are in his possession experience it. So all evil came through sin and disobedience. It didn't come from God. It came from our free choice. It came from Satan's free choice to rebel against God and then our free choice to rebel against God. So we have to remember that very clearly. Evil is not something that exists over here. Evil is when good corrupts itself. It is a lack of a good. All right? It's really important philosophically we understand that because, yeah, otherwise we would say God is evil. All right? 
Should we dress with all our skin covered for communion? Yes. I mean, not like like all of it, right? I mean, like, like you know, gloves and everything. You don't have. But the fact is, we should be modest. Look at the Old Testament for an example, right? To say, if if you're coming to mass trying to attract a husband or a wife, it's the wrong reason to come to mass, right? If you're trying to get girlfriends or boyfriends at mass, do that after mass, right? <laughs> Right? I mean, mass, you're here to worship God, right? Yes or no, right? I mean, yeah. Why is purple decorated around the church during Christmas? Ah, because it's not Christmas yet. Ha ha! <laughs> it's Advent, which is a penitential season to prepare us for Christmas. So like any feast, before you have a feast, you need to fast. Because otherwise, if you fat, feast all the time, what happens? You get fat, right? And you don't appreciate the good food. Because if you have rich food all the time, you're like, oh, it's just another day. But if you really want to appreciate Christmas you need to really have some self-denial beforehand so that you really enjoy the feast when it comes. Same with Easter. That's why we have Lent before Easter because we want to um, prepare ourselves. Okay. Should we increase fasting before communion? Um, yeah, the church teaches us you need to fast an hour before you receive Holy Communion. An hour is super easy. So if you can't do that, you're probably pretty sick, okay? Um, most people, because I preach long, you probably walk in with a Starbucks and probably not break the fast, right? <laughs> But don't do that, right? Because the whole idea, if you look at the way the church used to do it, you used to fast from midnight until Mass. So that was always the night before. It was a way to prepare, saying, I'm not going to eat. My first meal that I'm going to eat is Jesus. It's a beautiful tradition. You don't have to do it. But think like that. Think that I can probably not be scarfing down a hamburger right before I come to church, right? Yeah. Why does the church change? To make it easier. Uh, because uh, some people are scrupulous, and so what would happen is, is that if they, like, it was like no, nothing, like, like nothing before Mass, and so some people, they got to the place where, like, oh, if I even drink water, or if I, you know, have a stuff, so it, it was one of those things where just the church felt that it was keeping some people away from communion, potentially, if they had, like, health issues or whatever, and so they shortened it to three hours first, so three hours before communion, and even then it was sometimes seen as an impediment for some people, and so they, they did that. I wasn't there to make the decision, and so I, I don't, the powers that be decided that was a good idea. Ultimately, it's saying we didn't want it to be like a hard and fast rule that you must do this, you can't receive communion, but, but it's kind of like the same thing. We got rid of Friday penance. Uh, we didn't get rid of Friday penance, by the way, but people thought we did. By the way, though, tomorrow you don't have to do Friday penance. You know why? Because if you are a member of St. Alice, it's our feast day! Thank you. I'll calm down. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But yes, uh, as, as what we should do, yes, you, you, should, you should fast before communion. If you forget, don't receive communion that day. Right? Because we should be prepared. You shouldn't just walk up to communion and be like, oh, where am I? It's like, no, you should be thinking about today I'm going to receive Jesus. I should get ready. Right? So fasting helps us to realize if I feel a little bit hungry, I'm like, why am I hungry? Oh, I'm waiting for Jesus. Ah. Oh. What a beautiful thing that is, right? At the second coming, what happens to the souls in purgatory? Souls in purgatory will be finished with their purification. They'll go to heaven. At the second coming, that's when the end of time happens. And so at the end of time, purgatory no longer exists because its, it's purpose is done. So, yeah, at the end, there is only heaven and hell. Right now, purgatory exists. But at the second coming, um, there will not be purgatory any longer. Yes. Last question, where did the rosary come from? And I think we talked about it a little bit, but the rosary was given to St. Dominic uh, in the 12th century. And it existed beforehand as prayer beads in various forms. Yes? Uh, you talked about... Oh, microphone. You talked about the fall of Saint Satan and that that was because he was jealous that man was made in God's image. Yes. I was curious if that was a church doctrine if that's something that the church has decided is... It's speculative theology, so it's a very good question. So, yes, I want to clarify that, is that we don't know exactly um, the full extent of the reason why. But the best guess that we have, based on the scriptures, because there are scriptures that say, through the envy of the devil, death entered into the world. That's scripture, right? So that's very clear. Um, what is he envious of? It seems to be, the obvious answer is that he's envious of our destiny to be one with God in a way that he can't be because he doesn't have a body, right? And so it's, it's saying he, he, we're lower than him physically. We're lower in, on the plane of being. He's a higher order of being than we are. Angels are a higher order of being than humanity. The hierarchy of being is God, angels, 
people, animals, plants, inanimate objects, right? And so on the hierarchy of being, angels are higher than we are, and yet God made the angels to serve us, right? And so that's not fair that the higher would serve a lower, but God shows that's not how, that's how he thinks. God became even lower than the angels. He became one of us to exalt us, right? And so it's saying he's acting in a way that Satan can't understand, right? Because Satan is thing. if I'm a higher being, it's natural that people serve me, right? So it makes complete sense. It is not dogma that that's, so, so I have to distinguish that, that it is not dogma that that's the reason, but it seems to make the most sense. And to believe something contrary to that, it's kind of like, well, there's not really a better explanation that I've run into. So it seems to fit. Yeah. Other questions? Because we got to, you waited till the last minute. We got to do adoration. Come on, last question. Okay. All right. That's why I ask and people are like, oh, I don't want to ask. And they ask. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Why did, uh, like, non-believing in religion start? Why did non-believing in religion start? Um, right, atheism. Uh, well, the scriptures say very clearly the fool says in his heart there is no God, right? The, the reason is, is that it's, it's moral depravity. Sin darkens the mind. And so you have a choice when you sin. You can either admit that you're wrong and change, or you can say, I'm God and I make the rules. And that's the way a lot of people go, is they say, I don't want to believe there is a God, because if there is a God, he makes the rules and I have to obey them. If there's no God, it's very convenient. I can do whatever I want, because there's no afterlife, there's no judgment, there's no heaven, no hell, and so it only matters what I do in this life. And as long as I can get away with it, I can do it. But we see what kind of world that makes. If everybody lives that way, it's hell. Right? So, and in fact, hell is just literally getting what you want. Right? Because it's, it's just not what makes us happy. We, we, we need God, right? Good. Okay, good. We need to get ready for adoration. So, yes, yes, Douglas. One last one. No, you did not. Okay, good. Um, just as a reminder, uh, tomorrow we have Mass at 12.15. We also have Mass at 6.30. And then we have the Posadas. And then a dinner afterwards. So you're, you're all cordially invited, of course, to participate with us. It'll be really beautiful. We have the Relic of St. Alice that'll be here. Um, for veneration as well as our Lord who's here in the Blessed Sacrament. And on saints' feast days, God opens up a window of heaven a little bit wider through their intercession. So if you've got particular prayer needs, St. Alice is very happy to pray for you in a particular way. Okay, so we'll go ahead and prepare for adoration. Some people can help me to move the candles on the table to the side, please, very carefully. Guys, chop chop.
O salutare sostia, qui celi pandis hostium, bella premunto stilia, tara berfer auxilium, unitrino quedomino, sit sempiterna gloria, Qui vitam sine termino, nobis donet in patria. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, truly present in the Blessed Sacrament, fulfillment of all the wonders of old, of all the Old Testament types, the new manna from heaven, the Word made flesh, the law of God here, the love of God made present for us. We ask that you would pour out your grace, especially through the intercession of St. Alice as we celebrate her feast, that you would make yourself known in your saints and in your breaking of the bread so that all would come to believe. 